here's something very interesting to consider and seeing exactly the terrain we're heading into here with this sort of information, approximately 25% of men on death row in this country have a history of concussive head trauma to the front of their head front of the head where you wind up damaging the front of the brain, frontal cortical damage. And what we enter into here is this whole realm where this stuff is stupefyingly relevant to making sense of criminal behavior in humans. Possibilities of frontal damage. Currently, there is one law that's on the books in the majority of states in this country for deciding when somebody is so organically impaired that they count as having an insanity defense rather than being criminally uh, culpable for their acts. And this is something called the McNaughton Rule. McNaughton Rule, everybody gets taught that what the McNaughton Rule is, is can the individual tell the difference between right and wrong? This is the gold standard in courts as to whether or not somebody gets a organically impaired insanity defense ruling or not. McNaughton, whose work, whose all of this you know, cutting edge neurobiology was based on, McNaughton was most probably a paranoid schizophrenic, a guy in 1840 who attempted to assassinate the Prime Minister of England and was so clearly, clearly psychotic that this was the first case of the jury formally saying that no, there is something too sick about this man to hold him responsible for his acts. And the clearest thing that came through in that trial was he could not distinguish right from wrong. And the sort of thing that absolutely does in somebody attempting a McNaughton defense in a criminal trial is if there's evidence that they tried to cover their tracks afterward, that they were aware that they had done something which was unacceptable. What you see with people who can't tell the difference between right and wrong, there's no evidence of them trying to cover up their tracks. Where do you see McNaughton rules standardly applied? Severe, severe schizophrenics. And for example, John Hinckley, the person who tried to assess assassinate Reagan in the, 18, in the 1840s, in the 1980s, in the 1980s, but, well, I won't go there, but in the 1980s, and he was found innocent or guilty with, with an insanity defense because he failed a McNaughton ruling, severe schizophrenic, so this has been the gold standard in most of the courts in most of the states in this country. The only way you could be held not accountable for your criminal actions because of organic impairment would be if you can't tell the difference between right and wrong. But then you got a problem, because you get people with frontal cortical damage, and they can tell the difference between right and wrong. They know the rules, they can state them for you, yet they can't control their behaviors. And this comes through with all sorts of tests, but you could show this now with people with frontal damage. And for example, here's the M&M &M test that you give them, and what you've got is something desirable. In this hand, you have five M&Ms, in this hand, you have one. And the rule is, if the person reaches for the five M&Ms, you pull your hand away quickly, and they get one M&M as a reward. If they reach for the one M&M, you pull your hand away, and you give them five M&Ms. In other words, can they be disciplined enough to not reach for the five M&Ms, and instead hold out and go for one? You get more of a reward that way. By doing the harder thing, you will get more of a reward. Extensive frontal damage, they never, ever, ever are able to reach for the one M&M. They always get pulled towards the easier solution, the easier, more superficial way. There's five M&Ms. That's what I want. Instead of being able to do the executive stepping back and saying, if I go for one right now, I will get five. What is remarkable is you get an individual with frontal damage, and they will tell you what the rule is. They will sit there and say, I know, I know what you're up to. You want me to grab the five, but then I'll only get one. What I need to do is grab the and then they go for the five. <laughs> they can verbalize the rule right there. They know the difference between right and wrong. This is not organic impairment of knowing the rules. This is organic impairment of being able to follow the rules. And it is extraordinary what this one feature of what the frontal cortex does, the difference between knowing that there's a difference and being able to activate this pathway instead of that, this is hugely, hugely challenging in the courts. At the time that Hinckley attempted to kill Reagan, every single state in the country had a McNaughton ruling in place. Yeah? So for those people that just have the damage and know the rules, would they cover up the tracks in a court case so they would be deemed not 
the Okay. They, um, yeah, they would fail the McNaughton ruling, absolutely, because they know the difference between right and wrong. Um, and they would carry out the action and realize it was wrong, so try and hide it. Yeah, exactly. Or if they're disturbed enough, okay, for our purposes, yes, the person will know the difference between right and wrong, but they still cannot regulate their behavior. And this is a huge problem. What you wind up seeing is the McNaughton rule has generally been accepted in most states in this country. At the, at the time that Reagan, the assassination attempt was made, uh, federal criminal rulings had McNaughton ruling in it. Almost all the states had McNaughton, and something about 10 or 11 of them also had an organic impairment of volitional control, recognizing realms of frontal damage. And what was very interesting was in the aftermath of Hinckley being found criminally insane instead of guilty, there were these Neanderthal bellowings all over the country, editorials everywhere about how Hinckley had gotten away with it. Within a month, the federal government, Congress, revoked the ability to have a McNaughton ruling in any federal criminal trial. The majority, the vast majority of states in this country, their legislatures promptly leapt into action to repeal McNaughton. And along the way, I think in all but one or two states, the volitional impairment rulings went down the tubes also. And at this point, the vast majority of states in this country, you could have your frontal cortex blown out of the water and you've got one half neuron still functioning there, and that is not relevant in a court of law an area that desperately, desperately needs some reform. To give you a sense of how bizarre this could look, this dissociation here between knowing the difference between right and wrong and being able to regulate your behavior, this is what it would look like in terms of criminal sort of behavior with frontal cortical damage. And bizarrely, this was actually a law case I was involved with some years ago where this was an individual who had just been convicted of his eighth and ninth murders. And this was a serial murderer and and he was like a nightmare beyond imagination, what this man was. And this eighth and ninth one had just been two boys. He had abducted, uh, kept captive for a week, sexually uh, raped, sexually mutilated, and strangled. And this was number eight and nine. And he had been brought out of a maximum security prison in Florida where he was solving, where he was serving a whole bunch of other life sentences. And this was a case down in San Diego that he was brought out for that one. And the defense consisted of three minutes of the defense attorneys getting up and saying, yes, he did it. He absolutely did it. This was the defense. So this was now in the penalty phase deciding, was this person going to get the death penalty or was he going to get life in prison without the chance for parole? And the relevant thing about him was when he was six years old, he had had a massive car accident that destroyed his frontal cortex. He spent two months in a coma, no prior history of antisocial behavior, no family history of any of it, came out of it extremely behaviorally disinhibited. By age 11, he had assaulted his first individual, first murder by age 13, a completely broken machine. Here's what behavior looks like in somebody with no frontal cortex in this realm. One of the things he also did, in addition to his string of murders, were kidnapping and rape and aggravated assault. And this was one woman who had managed to fortunately survive this. And she'd been abducted by him, where he took her to his apartment and kept her there for a week, repeatedly raping her, beating her senseless, days and days of this going on. And eventually, whatever it is that shifted in him shifted. He had, of course, her wallet in the process of kidnapping her and seeing her name, where she lived. He finally says, okay, time to go, bundles her into his car and drives her home. And as he lets her out, he says, I had a really good time. I hope you did too. Here's my phone number. Maybe we can get together again sometime. And drives away. And no surprise, he was arrested within an hour or so and eventually sort of uh, pinned to a whole bunch of these other ones. This is what it looks like when you got no frontal cortex. What's interesting there is, is obviously making no attempt to cover his tracks, he was able to verbalize some of these rules and say it was inappropriate, and he was able even to be told the specifics of his own case with other names used and be able to say, whoa, that's not something you should do, that's against the law at these junctures, though, completely going off the rails. He had an interesting combination, though, 
which is that there were some elements of the difference between right and wrong uh, aspect of it. The fact that he had his frontal cortex damaged so early in life, what you tend to see is around age five or six or younger, the person tends to never quite incorporate the rules either. It's not till you get, say, adults who get frontal damage that you get the absolutely pure dissociation between this is not okay to do, this is a wrong thing to do, I am not going to do it, and then goes and does it. He instead had this much more mixed case there. When you get the frontal damage around ages five or six or younger, you get what is now termed acquired sociopathy. You don't do a great job of incorporating the rules themselves, and you certainly can't act on it. So this is what it looks like with someone who is that broken in this part of the brain.